Hello, welcome back to Go On The Run. And today we're going to do something slightly different than what we were doing um, in the last five parts. So previously we were looking at X509 certificate and establishing trust between like servers. And we ended it by showing that how oh, you can have programs that have secure communication using TLS. Now today, what I want to show you is something that's sort of related actually, but it's very different. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how you can do passwordless login. Now, whether or not you should actually use do passwordless login is something that you have to decide or your company is going to dictate to you. I'm just going to show you how it works and what it is. When I say passwordless login, I'm talking specifically in the context of SSH and SSH stands for secure shell. So um, even though we are not going to be using a password to log in, you're going to see that it's very secure because we're going to employ some of the same tactic that we used previously with a private key and a public key. Now, before we jump into the code, if you haven't yet hit that like button for this video, subscribe and definitely hit the notification bell so you can be notified when I post videos. All right, so let's get to it. So this is an illustration of how SSH password says password less login works. Try saying that 10 times fast. And it's very simplified. Like everything we do here is try to get concepts across and now going to the details. So let's say we have a server somewhere on your network, whether this is work or home or something, but it's just some computer. It doesn't have to be a server, just a computer that allows you to log in on which you have an account. This is important. And so here's our user, Bob, and he has an account on that server. And he wants to use his laptop, for example, or another computer to rub into that remote computer. Now, when I say remote, it doesn't mean the computer has to be somewhere across the world or something. Like you can be sitting at one computer here and the next computer is like next to you and you want to remote login. That's all it really means. You want to log into that other computer because you're not physically typing into that computer. And so this is what um, Bob would like to do. Now, if Bob tries to do a login with SSH using password, he would be prompted for a password and he has to type in his password and blah, blah, blah. And he can establish a secure shell to that server. But what Bob wants to do is move to doing passwordless login. So he's not prompted for a password. Question here is how does this work? Again, we're putting aside whether this is ultimately what you should be doing or not, but I'm going to show you that though it's still pretty safe and then you can go from there. Now I use passwordless login a lot and even within our organization, companies, many companies I've worked, I've worked for, they did not dissuade you from using passwordless login because as you're going to see, it's still pretty secure. So the first thing Bob is going to do is generate a public and private key. Now we know to generate um, keys. These keys are the RSA or in our case, we are generating RSA keys, but they can be, you know, um, DSA keys, for example, what we've been using RSA keys in all of our examples. So you can get a generate a public and private key, and it's going to store it, write those out to files. And we're going to see exactly how this can be done. What he's going to then do is copy that public key to the servers or any number of servers where he would like to do passwordless login. Any number of servers coming in the middle public key, you can share this out. But this time he's not sharing it out to random people. He's actually copying it to the server into his own directory. Remember, he has an account on that server. So he's copying this public key into that server. And we're going to see it. I'm going to walk through this so you can see it. I just want to kind of go over it to give you the idea. And then I'll walk through it and show you. So now that this public key is on that server, Bob can then now initiate a login session to that server from his laptop. When he does this, what's going to happen is that the server is going to see Bob is trying to log in. It can it has access to his public key, and it's going to issue a challenge back to the SSH client software running on Bob's computer. On the server, we have an SSH server, this software piece of software that allows many users to SSH in or to log in. On his laptop, we have an SSH client. So, what is this challenge that the server sends Bob? sends back to Bob's laptop or SSH client. It's something looks something like this. It essentially is a random number that the server generates, encrypts it with the public key, right? For that user who's trying to log in, so in this case, Bob, Bob's public key, and it sends that back to Bob. The SSH client 
has two options. If this key is not protected, the private key, well, it simply uses the private key, decrypts that random number because, well, it has access to that private key and it can decrypt it and it's the corresponding private key. It decrypts it and then it's going to send it back to the server. But remember I said there are two options. If the private key is protected, then Bob will be prompted to enter the password to unlock that private key. But because we're doing passwordless login, we don't want any prompts. So our private key here is not protected. So then the SSH client on the laptop decrypts this challenge, sees the random number, and then it now replies back to the server with a hash of this random number. Or it can be some other stuff included in the hash, but we're going to ignore all of that. And essentially, by doing that and sending it back to the server, the server can then verify like, ah, the client that was trying to connect does have the corresponding private key because otherwise they would have been unable to decrypt the message that I send with this public key. And so that's how the server verified. And notice no password was ever prompted for because we said the private key was not locked and no password went across the network. And all of this is going to be done over your TLS connection. The servers would have negotiated and done a secure um, network connection. So all this is not done in the public. But even if it was done, there's nothing secretly that's happening here in the open, right? Everything, the first thing was encrypted, that random number. And when it was sent back, the hash of it was sent back. So even if somebody's watching this connection, they still wouldn't be able to figure out anything. All right, so now that the server gets this hash back of the random number it generated, it goes, ah, yep, on the other side of this, the client that's connecting has the correct private key. And so at that point, Bob is considered to be authenticated and the SSA server lets him in and now he can work on that remote host from his laptop. So let's see what this looks like. So here I am at my command prompt and I'm going to go into a directory for... Um, today, which is SSH. And so I created a directory called passwordless login and SSH keygen. Now I'll talk a little bit more about this directory later, but if you look here, you're gonna see, I simply have a main that go application. And like I said, I'll cover that later. So how do you get a public key and a private key for login? Well, you can run SSH that keygen, which is this program or application that come with the open SSL um, SSH um, package. So I have a SSH client, which is simply this. As you're going to see, I'm going to use that just now. And there are a number of other programs that come along with it. SSH copy ID is useful when you want to copy your ID to another server, but we're not going to use that today. But I'm going to use the key gen to generate a new um, SSH key. And so if I press enter, it's going to ask me where do I want to store it. And notice by default, it wants to store it in my in this directory. This is important because generally that's where the server and the client expects to find SSH keys. But because I don't want to overwrite the keys that I already have, I'm going to say, put it in this current directory in a file called IDRSA. And what it's going to do is write my, my private key into that file and then a public key into that file name, that pub, as you will see in a minute. And it's asking me for a password. This is where I can provide a password to lock my private key so that nobody else can use my private key. Because if somebody, if I leave my computer open, for example, someone can have access to my private key and potentially copy it off my system or try and use it. But if it's password lock, they can do it. But we don't want to do password for our private key. So I'm going to just press enter, meaning no password. And so I'm going to enter again. And so I created a private key that does not have a password. And it spits out some stuff there on the screen. OK, so let me open my Visual Studio code to show you what was created. Now, before I show you, I had these files and the main that go. So this file was created. This is my ID as a private key. And you can see it says open SSH private key. And so that looks like that. But we know that this is just a PIM encoded file. And we'll get back to that in a bit. And here's my public key. And it looked like this, something like this. And it goes on for a bit. It's just a pretty long key but again it's um sort of um some kind of 64-bit encoding or something um, basically text encoding has my host name and my username at the end so that's fine that's what's generated so we just know it always these two text files essentially one is the public key the other is the private key so the question is how do we use them 
So let me open up a terminal here. And so this is a terminal in our directory. And I created a user name uh, an account, sorry, for a user GOTR, going to run account on a server that I have. So let's try and log in as that user on, to, in, on that server. And when I type this, you can see I'm prompted for a password. And notice I'm using my SSH client to talk to the SSH server on this machine. And I'm saying I want to log in as this user GOTR, right? And so I'll have to type the password. And there you go, I'm logged in. All right, so what is um, on this machine, on my account rather? And so I can see that oh, I have these files. All right, so this is an account I created and I didn't do anything. All right, so what I can do is open up a second terminal here. And how do we then set up this machine, this remote account, so that we can do passwordless login? So the first thing I want to do is create a directory called that SSH. You remember when I was trying to generate my key, it wanted to put it in this directory anyway? Well, not this directory on this com computer, but it wanted to put it in a directory called that SSH in my home directory. Well, same thing. On the remote system, which I happen to be using here is a Linux box, but it could be any other um, system like a Unix-like system. Um, I'm going to put it in the, that SSH directory for my home directory, right? So this is what's happened. I just created this directory called that SSH. It's empty. The next thing I want to do is create a file in this directory called authorized keys. That's just the convention. That's what the SSH server looks for. So just follow it. And so in this file, I can put any number of public keys. So if I have multiple accounts, I'm logging in for multiple different hosts and so on, I can just put my SSH key there. I can, um, if I had another key to put into this, in this file, I would just simply add it below here. But right now I just have one key. So I copy it from the top, paste it here, and I save it. Now notice all the things I've just done, the directory I've created, this file I've created, this text file by copying my key, public key, and put it in this remote host. On my local host, this is where the files are. This is where they were created. Okay, so I have this other terminal open. And so now let's try logging in again. This time, I'm going to try logging in and it prompts me for a password. Now, I just told you that I copied the um, public key on the other side. So why did it prompt me for a password? Well, that's because by default, SSH is looking at my local directory on my Mac here in the that SSH directory, and it couldn't find a key that corresponds to this. So I don't want it to do that. Maybe remember, my private key that corresponds to this public key is stored right here in this directory. So I should give it this private key. So when I use the minus I, I'm saying use this particular private key um, when authenticating with um, to this account and user on this host. So when I run this now, as you can see, I was able to log in this time without being prompted because I provided the private key that uh, allow this client, this SSH client on my Mac to basically solve that challenge or answer the challenge from the SSH server. And so we could verify that that's, I'm on the same server. I'm going to make a directory or touch file and then if I go back here, you can see that oh, it is the same file, right? Touch this, that, this. All right, so now you've seen how um, we can log in remotely using SSH. Now, why did I say that oh, this is fairly secure? Well, because no password was ever transferred for me to, from my local machine to that remote mach machine. And so people who tend to work with a lot of remote servers tend to do SSH um, login without a password. If you still need a password, well, then just when you create your key, add a password to it, or just don't use SSH um, keys to log in, just type the password for that remote machine. And it's gonna work essentially the same way, but password's still not gonna traverse the network. Okay, so I said that um, I'll explain this file. I'm not really going to explain the file so much as tell you what it does. It actually does exactly what SSH um, keygen does. So for example, if you're on a machine, 
uh, on a Windows machine or even a Mac machine or whatever, and you do not have SSH key gen, well, let's um, fix that for you right now. Um, so I'm going to exit here and be back on my system. And then I am going to remove this keys that I have created with SSH keygen. And notice they're gone. And now I'm simply going to run, do go run, and have it run and create keys here. And notice I'm using the same name by default, but of course you can override the name or use anything else. And feel free to modify the code. But anyway, if we go back and we look at this, we'll see it all this public key look essentially like the same one SSH key gen generated, except my key doesn't have any host name or anything, or like an email address at the end, which is fine. All that was, was the current lockdown user who created this key at the host on which they're running. We could have certainly pulled up that information and added it to the file, but it's not necessary. And then here is our public key, and it looks essentially the same thing. Notice when the one was, the key was created by um, SSH keygen, it says open SSL. That's because SSH and the tools I'm using is part of the open SSH package, but um, and set of tools. But here we wrote our own and you can review the code for that. It's essentially stuff we've done already. Okay, so now that I've created my own private key and public key, well, let's do the same thing. I'm going to grab this, I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to go back over here to my server and let's just um, prove that though we cannot log in with, um, with this key. Well, actually, we can try doing that by simply coming here and doing SSH. And if we try to log in with this private key, notice it's a private key that I generated and it is not gonna be the corresponding private key for the public key that's already in the server. So we should expect that this login should fail, and it does. Notice how it prompts me for it, for password. So I'll go back to the server, and I'm going to, let's just do that SSH, and then authorize keys. And what I can do is add the second key that I just created. I mean, of course, we don't need the first one, but I just wanted to show you that though you can have multiple keys, but I'm going to remove this and just keep the one keys because since we deleted the corresponding private keys, no point in keeping it. And so now when I go back here and I now try to log in, notice how um, it's telling me as how, oh, my private key has the wrong per permission. Essentially, it's telling me as how, oh, you know what? This key is open for the world to re read it. And that I can easily fix by going to my Go code. And of course, when we create our keys, we can tell it change the permission. But I'm not gonna worry about that. Instead, I'll do it the easy way and simply just to change mod, to change the permission. I wanna make it only readable and writable by the owner of this key. And then nobody else should be able to have access to it. And I'm gonna do ID RSA. I only need to do that to the private key. Remember, that's the only key that I need to worry about is this private key. I don't want anybody else to be able to access. The public key, doesn't matter. Okay, so now let's um, try logging in again. And bam, notice I was able to log in with the keys that I generated. So hopefully that um, helps you sort of tie up further how we use in security, how to secure your environment, how to secure your login. If you haven't thumbs up the video already, what are you waiting for? Um, leave comments, good, bad, the ugly. Uh, I still try to read them and try to respond. Constructive criticism is, is welcome. And subscribe. Thank you for subscribing if you already subscribed. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you can be notified when I upload videos. Take care, stay safe, bye.